Greetings and welcome to this episode of Everybody's Business, a podcast from the National Entrepreneur Center. I'm Jerry Ross. I'm in control of the microphone because I'm president of the National Entrepreneur Center. But I have my sidekick here with me in the studio, Rachel Madsen. Say hello, Rachel. Hello, Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's right. Following orders, right? She's so good at following orders sometimes, right? <laughs> Yeah, some there's other people behind the scenes that keep me in line as well. That's right. So. Well, and, and Rachel keeps the trains running on time, and uh, we call her our, our air traffic controller. Uh, keeps things happening here. So thank you for what you do, and thank you for joining us today on the show. Thank you, John. I, I've talked a couple of times about almost being late for the show. Um, <laughs> I, I got, I wandered down the international aisle at Publix. Uh, I was stopping in to get a cup of coffee and, and uh, pick up some stuff for lunch. And I went down the international aisle and was just fascinated by the number of hot sauces. I love hot sauce. I do uh, know that. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I went through the Hispanic food section and then into the Indian food section. And um, I just, I love the international flavor that, that the Orlando community has embraced. And so and, uh, Orlando has visitors from all over the world and has, has been developing a culture here that's truly an international uh, culture. Uh, from all over the world. <laughs> I can attest to that. I'm originally from Indiana and moving to Orlando. Um, for me, it was a little bit of a culture shock, just how multicultural it is. Sure. It was amazing to just be able to see all, just literally all different types of colors. So uh, Central Florida gets about 70 million visitors a year. And so it's not unusual to be in an elevator and hear two or three different languages being spoken. I have, yeah, I tried this app try to teach me Spanish. Oh yeah. <laughs> I stuck with it for about a week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you learned enough Spanish, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I think my high school stuck a little bit. So I know where the El Baño is generally. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and Cerveza. Right? Oh yeah. <laughs> that that <laughs> works. I know trash. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's true. That's true. Uh, it's also interesting how many uh, different cultures come here to the National Entrepreneur Center. Mm -hmm. And so we have lots of people who arrive that want to start a new business uh, in the States, uh, but also people who are doing import and export. Uh, and that's why we now have the international, the Central Florida International Trade Office located here. And so um, Orlando has, has not only uh, diversified in population, but the, the international trade that's happening with, with having a, a port, uh, the, Port Canaveral and the Port of Tampa is about an hour and a half either direction, east and west, in an international airport. And so in business, international trade is is hugely important. And with with that many visitors and that many theme parks, uh, that means a lot of products are coming in from all over the world and we're exporting all over the world. So it's truly become an international city. And, and I hadn't really expected that. No. Um, thank you for all those who export the, and import the coffees. <laughs> I just had to give a little shout out. You, for you, that. And that too was on the international aisle. It so I, I was uh, trying different coffees. Uh, and that's been, been one of the fun things that we do here is try those different coffees. Uh, who's uh, speaking of international. Yes. Uh, why don't you uh, tell us who the guest is today? We have Khalid Munir. He is the president of Jupiter Properties and the Asian Chamber of Commerce he's, for Central Florida. He's the president there. He is the president. And they are located here in the National Entrepreneur Center. They are. Uh, so he should have some uh, great perspectives and some great insights on, on the international trade aspect. So we'll get into that when we come back. Hi, this is Jerry Ross coming to you from the National Entrepreneur Center. I'm coming to you from my home office because our staff as well is working remotely. But we're working remotely to serve the small businesses in Central Florida. If you have a need, if you want to get connected, there are many ways to do that with the National Entrepreneur Center. So we are still answering your calls. We are still answering your email. In fact, we've been pretty busy these last few months, even working remotely to launch the new online learning platform in partnership with The Lonely Entrepreneur out of New York City, who had about 300 learning modules uh, of content readily available. And we've made a partnership to make that available to you for free while you're working remote. So while you may be home working alone, you don't have to be alone because the National Entrepreneur Center and our 14 resident organizations 
have one mission, and that's to help you grow your business. We're back with Everybody's Business, the podcast from the National Entrepreneur Center in Orlando, Florida. I'm your host, Jerry Ross. Thanks for joining us today. And we have a guest that you're going to enjoy. It's about experience. It's about international experience uh, and lots of entrepreneurial tips and insights. Our guest today is Khalid Munir. He's married for 40 years. He is a, an investment trained banker for over two decades. He is the owner of Jupiter Properties for over two decades. And they deal in residential commercial real estate, but also in business brokerage and international investment. He's a member of the Orlando Economic Development Partnership and uh, Leadership Orlando. He is the president of the Asian American Chamber, which resides right here at the National Entrepreneur Center. So please welcome my guest, Khalid Munier. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. Thank you. Good morning and uh, great to see you, Jerry. Tell me a little bit about uh, Jupiter Properties and what you do there. Uh, Jupiter, I'm the uh, founder and president of Jupiter Properties. It's a company I founded 23 years ago, and uh, we specialize in commercial, residential, and business brokerage. I have um, around 32 agents, real estate agents in my company. They come from 18 different countries and they speak 17 different languages. So, very, so very, we were a very, very international company. Very much like the United Nations there. Exactly. And uh, that is a strength of our company because uh, it's Central Florida is a very multi, multicultural, uh, multinational area. So we are clients. They come from um, all ways of life from different countries. So they like to connect with somebody from their own country that can understand their culture, that can understand that, hey, uh, you, we need a house which is not facing east, which is not facing west, or et cetera, et cetera. Sure. What, uh, how did you come about starting the, the company itself? Well, Jerry, I've, um, I, I, I've been in uh, my own business for the last 29 years. I've been in the state. So previous to Jupiter Properties, I owned a number of service-oriented businesses here in Palm Coast. And it just happened that one of my clients was in the real estate business. And we started talking about real estate. And he said, you'll be a great fit because of your knowledge, because of your experience. Um, knowledge and fluency in other languages, etc., and your ability to connect with people because it's a service-oriented industry. So that's how I got started, and uh, he encouraged me to go and get a license, and then he also encouraged me to join his company, etc. And before I realized, uh, 23 years ago, I was in the business, and since I have never looked back. <laughs> what What was the hardest part of getting started? The hardest part, like any other. Uh, small business that you start off uh, as an entrepreneur is trying to adjust to the new realities. Uh, as they say, the, 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 the hardest part is really if you're working for somebody for an organization, uh, you have a regular paycheck coming in. And right. uh, you get hooked on getting a regular paycheck, which is good because you can plan your life out. You know you're going to get a paycheck at the end of the month. But in your own business, there's no guarantees like that. And you start realizing after a while that, hey, this is totally, totally different. I may not get a paycheck for six months. So I better be prepared to face those kind of economic issues. So uh, the hardest part is really trying to discipline yourself that, hey, this is not a nine to five job like you had, but this is a 24 seven stress in building up your business. Right. And, and sometimes when people say uh, entrepreneurs are risky, uh, I say, you know, entrepreneurs uh, have to manage their risk box. And, and part of that managing your risk is being able to, to, to handle that kind of stress of I, I've got to make payroll or I've got to uh, pay my bills by the end of the month. And, and so that becomes uh, a pressure that you have to be willing and, and ready to to take on. So tell me this, uh, that's part of starting the business. Now that you have uh, dozens of employees, uh, what, how did that change? How did that, that stress or how did that uh, uh, management of an organization change as you started to add employees? Well, 
uh, as with everything else, over time, you start uh, building up your business, you start consolidating, et cetera. And it's uh, all a question of time. You start getting financially viable in your business. You start expanding. You start building up the financial resources. And we are so lucky here in Central Florida because we have the NEC, National Entrepreneur Center, where you can go and uh, uh, when you can go and um, get access to a lot of the resources uh, like training, et cetera, or having a business plan written or the finance that's available to the small companies. So those resources are very helpful and they're very useful uh, in building up your business. And that's exactly what I did. I attended a lot of your courses there. I learned a lot. And uh, that's uh, what helped me to go to the next stage in my business. Sure. Uh, how how does managing people, uh, especially the number that you have, uh, change how you uh, think as an entrepreneur? Well, uh, managing people to uh, is it to me is not the hardest part of the business. Uh, most of the people that come and work for me, they come to work for me out of their own choice rather than me going out there trying to hire people. So they come in because of my because of my standing in the community, in the business community, because of my standing in the in, in my profession, in the real estate business, etc. So I've been very lucky in my 23 years in business, 20 years I've had since I had my own company, Jupiter Properties. I probably had four people leave me, and that's only because they they moved out of out of the our town to another location, or they went on to start their own companies. And these are the people who started their career, real estate career, with me. So I've been very fortunate in that. I know that is one of the main issues that a lot of businesses have is trying to deal with uh, with employees, etc. Because you have to realize that. We are, you know, as we were all human beings, we have our own issues. So you have to be very understanding about other people's issues. Sure. And uh, just accordingly. I mean, I have my degree is um, in behavioral science, which is mainly psychology. So I'm well positioned to understand and handle issues related to to the individual, to the individual employees, et cetera. So I find that quite a, quite quite challenging and quite uh, satisfying in helping people. Sure. Uh, so uh, th- first of all, that is a, a huge benefit when people come to you and, and are aware of, of your reputation and, and they say, I want to work for this company and I want to work for you. Uh, so that particular piece isn't difficult. What was the hardest part? Uh, the hardest part when, when I started the business was really um, being new in the business. Uh, people tend, tend to think of it, hey, he started his business. And most people think, tend to take a negative, a negative view. Well, you know, it's not, it's not going to last very long because, as you said, it's a big failure rate. You get a restaurant business in a restaurant business is a ninety-three percent failure rate. So uh, initially, uh, the failure rate in business is very high. So really, you have to, when you start a business, you have to be prepared. Make sure you're financially viable for six months, seven months while you try to establish your business. You can't have the business paying your bills at home uh, because then the business will, every dollar that you take out of a small business, when you start the business feels it. So you've got to keep the maximum financial resources in the business to make sure you you build, you stay afloat until it's able to stand on on its own two feet. Because you get into a situation where you take, you know, you've got bills to pay at home. If you take the money out of your business, the business suffers. If you don't take the money out of the business, then the, then the, then the household suffers. So it's a very it's a balancing act. You have to be very very fiscally uh, conservative, uh, conserve your resources, and um, so it's a good idea to have another source of income while you're trying to establish a new venture. And so that's that's a challenge for startups. What's the challenge of being in business for two decades now? I think. Uh, the the biggest challenge is that you tend to go very you, you tend to go very lethargic. In other words, you just tend to just sit back and uh, not go out there and uh, and expand your business and take it to the next stage where it needs to go. Uh, and your business is running, it's bringing in the money, etc. So you feel very comfortable. So it's a challenge to try and get out of your comfort zone. And try and get to the next stage and expand and be out there, etc. Luckily, in my business, 
I'm going. To, I, I expand in the sense that I go overseas and I get clients from uh, from uh, from the Middle East. I used to travel to Singapore also before to the Far East, etc. But with a pandemic last year, for example, before the pandemic, I went to Peru, England, Dubai, and China, uh, uh, sourcing business. <laughs> but unfortunately, the COVID situation has put a dampener on that. So that has limited our ability to expand and get clients from overseas. But hopefully this thing will be over and then we can get back to some kind of normality and have a normal life. Well, we're going to take a break right now, but we're going to come back and talk about the international piece of your business and also your role as the president of the Asian American Chamber. So stay right there. We'll be right back. The National Entrepreneur Center in Orlando, Florida, has been around since 2003 and today is home to 14 business support organizations who have a single mission to help you grow your business. Through free business coaching, low-cost training, and valuable business connections, these 14 business support organizations assist thousands of entrepreneurs each year in starting, growing, and scaling their businesses. So why not visit the website at nationalec.org today or give us a call at 407 420 4848 to discover how you might take your business to the next level. And by the way, the National Entrepreneur Center is funded entirely through local sponsors, which include Walt Disney World Resort, the University of Central Florida, the City of Orlando, and Orange County government, just to name a few. So let's get connected today and get growing. Check out our website at nationalec.org. Welcome back to Everybody's Business, the podcast from the National Entrepreneur Center. Today, we're talking with Khalid Munir, who is the president of Jupiter Properties and exploring his entrepreneurial journey. Uh, Khalid, we left off with you talking about uh, traveling the world prior to COVID to, to help continue developing your business. Uh, so how did the COVID shutdown affect uh, the business in, in reaching out internationally? Well, with the... Uh... International travel to a standard still right now, we've had very few clients coming in from overseas. So it's totally shut down as far as that business is concerned. Um, in fact, it's, what's happening is a lot of those clients who invested here, they bought a lot of property around Devonport area and they gave it to Airbnb as an investment. They've been suffering because there's no tourists coming in. So hopefully with the vac vaccination and so on, it'll open up the international market. And the same with the hospitality industry. And as we get the corporate client back, it, the, the progress in the hospitality industry, filling the hotels, et cetera, is going to be very slow also. So we have to focus in terms of how we can, we can send the message out there that uh, you know, international travelers coming to Orlando, they are safe, they, are, uh, uh, they have nothing to worry about. Uh, everything is sanitized and cleaned, et cetera. So it's going to take a little time, but uh, they've already started doing that. The airlines are recently, yesterday, a couple of days ago, they're going to require uh, COVID-free certificates, et cetera, to, uh, to, to, to travel internationally on their airline. So that should help. Otherwise, we have to think in terms of how we can attract the tourists back and investors back in Central Florida. It's not going to be an easy process, but we, Hope you'll come back soon. Right. And and while those issues are happening here in Central Florida, they're also happening all over the world. And that's been part of what's unique about this pandemic is as many times there's a disaster in a part of the world and, and the rest of the world continues. And yet this was a uh, an event that, that happened everywhere in every city was affected. And so uh, real estate, uh, especially international real estate has been affected as well, but hopefully we're seeing the end of, of uh, or the end of the tunnel, uh, as you say, uh, with the vaccinations coming, uh, with people getting more adept at how we clean and, and take care of our, our staff. Uh, when, when this came out, and I, I'm now uh, asking about your role as the president of the Asian Chamber, uh, there was a lot of uh, concern about where the virus came from. There was a lot of blame uh, placed around. How did that affect members of the Asian Chamber? Well, Jerry, uh, because some of our leadership in Washington, they were promoting this as a Chinese virus. And as you've seen recently also in the political turmoil in Washington, if you keep repeating the message, this is a Chinese virus, it's a Chinese virus, 
when people come to believe uh, that it's the Chinese that brought this virus over, or they were responsible for it. So uh, stereotyping is very easy. So we had uh, some of our members calling us saying that they were targeted people here in locally here in uh, in Orlando, especially on in some of the places like the Publix on uh, Colonial Drive, that uh, they were targeted, and some of them were actually uh, were targeted of physical abuse. Uh, and saying you bought the virus, or you are responsible for this, because it's you know if you uh, stereotype-wise, you uh, you look Chinese because everything uh, you know sometimes just goes unlooked. But we had those issues to deal with. But luckily, they were only isolated cases, so we didn't consider it taking to the next stage, having the the the, 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 the officials here in uh, Central Florida deal with it at a higher level. So it kind of petered out after a while. Well, that's that's good to hear. And and fear fear does uh, a lot of crazy things with people. And so uh, we've had several uh, uh, s- seminars here, uh, outreach programs to to talk about uh, diversity and inclusion and equality, uh, where people do get stereotyped. And so um, tell me about um, that. Asian American Chamber here in Central Florida, and your role as the president, uh, has that uh, demographic continued to grow? Is it can? Um, I know it's had a significant economic impact here. Uh, so let's talk about the chamber because uh, the chamber is a partner here at the National Entrepreneur Center. I think you hit the nail on the head when you started talking about stereotyping, because that is exactly the role of our chamber: is to create that understanding. Uh, be, uh, between the Asian American owned business own, Asian American owned business owners and the local community. So when we uh, talk about trying to get business from overseas, etc., we tend to forget the fact that uh, we are a very multicultural society here in Central Florida. And to reach out to these people in various community, if you don't do that, you're missing a significant s- section of the population. The Asian American population in Central Florida is around 10%. And according to the last figures that I had, they may, there are 15,000 Asian American owned businesses here in Central Florida. And they make a total contribution of something like $2.3 billion to the, to, the, to, the, to the Central Florida economy. Now those are significant numbers. So if you are a businessman, you cannot afford to ignore that section of the section of the community. Not only that, we have Stephanie, uh, Rep, uh, Rep, Representative Stephanie Murphy, who's also Asian, uh, Asian American, serving in the U.S. House of uh, Representative. So you can see the significant that the Asian Americans uh, have here in Central Florida. Uh, if you go to Dr. Phillips, there are 350 Asian, uh, Asian American physicians that live in Dr. Phillips alone. I, 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 and I know these figures because uh, I, I, I socialize with them and I invite them in the chamber. So sure. it's an important, it's very important in order to understand and remove the stereotyping that you, the people get to businessmen, reach out to organizations like the Asian American Chamber and the Hispanic Chamber so they can get a better understanding of, of, of people and the culture, et cetera, which will help them to enhance their business also. Well, and, and those numbers that you're quoting are significant. Here, just here in Central Florida, uh, those are numbers that are significant all over the country uh, in every market uh, by reaching out to the the Asian uh, demographic, the Hispanic demographic, the, the Black American demographic, uh, lots of, of different demographics that if we do stereotype, uh, we're, we're limiting the scope and scale of our business. Exactly. And it's very important because, as you mentioned, nationally also, you're looking at the minorities, they form 50% of the population in the United States now. I mean, you can tell from the fact that our next vice president is a, has, is an Asian uh, American origin. So it, it's a very significant portion. And they are here, for example, in Central Florida. For the Asian American, you're looking at uh, per capita uh, income of around about $75,000 compared to the average of uh, around $40,000. So it's a significant 
uh, purchasing power group, they have a much higher home ownership also. And that's uh, also significant if you're in the real estate business uh, to make sure that you connect with that community and our Asian American Chamber of Commerce is one of the sources where you can come in, meet these people and expand their business. Well, and I think uh, as as we've experienced uh, over the, the last few months, uh, diversity, equality, inclusion has been part of the national conversation. Uh, and, and as I relate that to a small business, many times we make stereotypes of, of who we want to approach and sell to. We, we think, well, the, you know, um, those, those areas uh, may not be able to, to buy from me. And yet, many times... Uh, when you pursue that, whether it's whether it's age, whether it's uh, income, uh, there are buyers in every uh, strata. And so if we begin to uh, limit people based on our own stereotypes, uh, we're not only limiting our business, uh, but we're limiting, limiting uh, the quality of life because uh, uh, as we open that and, and become more inclusive, uh, we we uncover great relationships, uh, much like the relationship that you and I have. Uh, so I, I'm honored to, to consider you my friend. Uh, let me ask you about your life journey. Uh, where did you grow up? Well, my life journey began, I was born in Pakistan, and my father uh, emigrated to Britain in 1959. So two years later, 1961, he being a first generation immigrant, he still hadn't saved enough money to get uh, my mother and my three siblings from Pakistan to England. So my mother and my sibling, we traveled from Pakistan to England on, a, on, on any means of transportation we could find, whether it was train or a bus or whatever. So we went on a one month journey covering nine countries, travel to nine countries, uh, including places like Iran and Turkey and et cetera. And then we arrived in Britain in 1961. So I grew up, uh, I was nine years old then. Uh, and I grew up in Britain from the age of nine. I went to school there and I went to university. And then one of the ambitions that I always had, having gone through that difficult time, never sat on a plane. I always wanted to go into a career which would allow me to travel and live and associate myself with people from other countries. So I went to, after graduation, I joined an international bank and I finished up traveling to 51 countries, living and work, living and working in 11 countries, learning 10 languages, because that was one of the requirements when I used to get posted to these countries to learn the local language. So sometime I, 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 you have to be very careful what you, what you wish for in life. Because then you get to a stage where I would be sitting at my desk in Dubai I was, when I was in investment banking and my general manager at five o'clock in, in the evening would, tell, would ask me, hey, can you, I can't travel. Can you go and attend this nine o'clock meeting in Brussels in the morning? <laughs> so I would say, I would uh, say, oh my God. So I would travel there, attend the meeting at nine o'clock and be back in Dubai and uh, by the next evening. So I'm very grateful. I'm, I'm very fortunate to have achieved my lifetime goals, which was to travel and learn languages. And most of all, to, to, to associate with people from other countries, understand them, understand how they think. You've probably seen me in many chambers, involved in a lot of chambers. And, and that's my passion is to associate the people and understand what, how they were their cultures. Because I've always been a student of history in Britain. And so was that something that you, you knew you wanted to do uh, early on as a child? Yes, I, uh, I was fascinated when I used to watch TV and I used to uh, watch, um, because that was just after the British Empire started disbanding. So there used to be a lot of world coverage on, for example, the islands of Seychelles in the Indian Ocean, uh, getting independent, they show that, or uh, Dubai, sure. get, get independence from the British. So I used to be fascinated by these, uh, by, 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 these view, by, by these pictures of these countries. And I did finish up in the Seychelles, working there for four years, <laughs> and Dubai, working there for five years. <laughs> so... 
So you have to you have to be careful of what you wish for because it just might come true. And as you found out, you better have your go bag ready because you never know when you're going to get the call to jump on a plane. Exactly. Otherwise, I used to call my wife at home and say, get my suitcase ready and just send it directly to the airport. <laughs> and the driver would pick it up and then I got to get the eight o'clock flight. <laughs> That's right. Well, hang on to that thought. We're going to be uh, take a break and get a word from our sponsors, but we'll be right back. The Nash Entrepreneur Center has made it easy for you to learn business principles from anywhere at any time with NEC Online. As a supplement to all the great resources at the Nash Entrepreneur Center, you now have free access to over 300 learning modules that you can access at any time. Thanks to the generous sponsorship of Wells Fargo and our partnership with The Lonely Entrepreneur, you can access this powerful online learning platform for free. Learn on your own time and at your own pace. Access product reviews and participate in weekly group coaching opportunities. Right now, the only thing missing is you. So check out our online learning platform today at nationalec.org. That's nationalec.org. Did I mention it's free? We're back. I'm Jerry Ross, president of the National Entrepreneur Center, and you're listening to Everybody's Business, the podcast from the National Entrepreneur Center. Uh, today, we're talking with Khalid Munier, who is the president, founder, owner of Jupiter Properties. Uh, Khalid, you grew up in Pakistan. You you made the the trek into uh, into London and uh, Britain. Uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? Did you have an idea of, of here's what I want to be? I think uh, I was just focused because, as I mentioned earlier, I was focused. Uh, I was fascinated by uh, by the world and people in the world. So I just wanted to go to any profession which would allow me to travel overseas and live overseas, uh, et cetera, which was my ambition. So as I, I was when I was in graduating from university. Somebody, one of my friends mentioned, hey, I have a job in the bank and the bank is global. It has network all over the world and there's opportunities to travel. And I didn't even think twice. So I applied to the bank, I got accepted, graduated, and I was with them for four weeks. And then they started my world tour. And in the first two years, I was in Germany, Italy, Netherlands, France, and Switzerland as part of my training. Was that something that was scary? Was that something that was scary to you, uh, or was that something that you just couldn't wait to to embrace? I backpack all around Europe, right up to Sweden, when I was eighteen years old, and then the following year I backpacked all the way to Turkey, when I was nineteen years old. So traveling and getting to know people was uh, nothing strange to me by the time I started working. Some of those things that you engaged in um, as, as a young person growing up is things that you are now using as part of your business. As from Orlando, Florida, you're doing international real estate sales uh, and dealing with uh, a lot of different cultures here, especially as president of, of the Asian American Chamber. Exactly. And I concentrate in the areas also where I lived and I know how the businessmen in those countries think. Uh, for example, you know, if you go to the Middle East, uh, your, your, your uh, investors, there they like investing in land. So I saw a lot of land in the Middle East. If you go to Singapore, the Far East, they like income generating properties. They want to know what the return is because they only get about quarter percent on on their bank deposit. So even if you can offer them, uh, if you can show them something which makes them 3% return, they're very happy with that. And so uh, when businesses are, are looking around as we've been through this shutdown and, and people are trying to pivot to new opportunities, international trade becomes a, a great opportunity if you understand the cultures. And so in order to do that, you, you have to go to to do your research, do your homework, and you can reach out to the National Entrepreneur Center uh, because we have a Central Florida International Trade Office located here that can help you as you look to grow your business internationally, whether that's exporting or importing, you've got to do your homework. And, and there's, there's help out there at the Central Florida International Trade Office located here at the National Entrepreneur Center. So uh, 
in, in our effort to help people expand opportunities, uh, many times people don't think about doing international trade. And so with you, uh, that, that came as, as uh, one of the, the pieces of you in building a business was always considering international trade. Is that right? Exactly. And then uh, the thing is that uh, with uh, dealing with uh, international people out there, you got to think in terms of a long term building up long term relationships also. If you're dealing with people from Asia, from the Middle East, they want to know who you are first because they're doing business with you as an individual rather than the company that you're working for. That's so right. They and- would want to know your family man, if you've, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, because they want to build up the trust initially especially when they're coming from overseas, they don't know anybody, they haven't dealt with you before in business, et cetera, et cetera. So building up trust, the relationship is very important. So, and it's a long-term process. It's not like, you know, you give them a John Wayne handshake and they're going to buy something from you uh, far from it. And, and building a business relationship doesn't happen overnight. We had an experience here where uh, there were uh, procurement folks uh, that were, traveling to the food show in Chicago uh, to look at different foods that they were going to buy for their um, resort hotels in China. And so they had had uh, had a group that came and went to the food show in, in Chicago and decided they wanted to come to Orlando to visit Disney World. And as part of that, uh, they connected with us about our international trade uh, training. And so we had a, a very small um, expo of our food suppliers here from Central Florida. And they were everything from barbecue and, and beef to hot sauce. And those um, high-level procurement folks from, from the resorts in China uh, came to our little training rooms and, and, and sampled local fare. And after that, was they went to off to Disney and enjoyed themselves. But the feedback was uh, they felt like they had a better connection uh, with the folks here in Orlando, uh, because it was more personal and it was more one-on-one. And, and they said, we, we went to this big food show in Chicago and we felt like we, we got more connection and, and more knowledge with, with people in Orlando because it was that personal thing. Do you find that? Uh, exactly. It's, a, you know, building a trust is very important. To give you an example, I, um, when I was dealing with Singapore, selling real estate in Singapore, I just got a local partner, Singaporean partner based in Singapore as the front for my company. So they trusted her more than they trusted me. And she trusted me anyway, because we were business partners. Sure. So that worked out very nice because she, when I used to go to Singapore, travel to Singapore, she used to organize everything. Same thing in Dubai. I used to attract a lot of business from Dubai. I signed a memo with a real estate company in Dubai and they would get everything ready. And my job was to go there and make presentation at the hotels and then close the deals. And same in China, I was in China uh, two years ago. Uh, I visited some of the hospital there as part of my consultancy business. Uh, I have a partner here based in Orlando uh, who's Chinese. He arranged everything. He was a front uh, for the company and I just made presentations and shook hands, et cetera, and we closed on a deal. And we had, uh, three months later, we had a delegation come from China that I uh, connected them up with Advent Health, et cetera. So trust is, is a very important word when you're dealing with international, uh, international bias. It is. And if, and if you don't personally have that, uh, that opens the channels for partnerships, uh, international partnerships, and that can help uh, any business uh, who is looking to do international trade. Uh, whether that's uh, import, export, or services. So uh, dealing in that international trade arena, it it offers so much opportunity. It offers uh, a lot of uh, additional uh, marketplace, uh, but it it can't be done without some homework, without some due diligence on on your part, because uh, cultures are different, uh, laws are different, uh, it's important that you do your homework, but if you do, there's great opportunity there in international. Uh, let me ask you. Uh, let me just add something there. Um, there are a lot of resources available here in Central Florida to help you with that. For example, they have the uh, Enterprise uh, Florida, their office here. Uh, they organize even business trips overseas. 
I've been on uh, two of them, and they're very helpful. Then you've got the CIPTO, Center for Oratory, at the NEC, and then you've also got, you know, there are 14 international chambers here, based here in Florida, Brazilians, French, et cetera, et cetera. So. Sure. So every community will have support for you. You don't have to do this alone. Uh, the U.S., uh, Commerce Department has district export councils uh, located in every major met metropolitan area. The uh, small business development centers are funded by the SBA. They're located in every uh, area. Every state has an international outreach program. And so uh, it, it is a big topic. It's a big opportunity. Uh, but you don't have to do this alone. And so I encourage you, wherever you're listening from today, that you reach out, find those local resources because they will help you accelerate your business, uh, whether it's doing business internationally or locally. Uh, you don't have to do this alone. So Khalid, uh, we're going to come back and ask you a few closing questions, but uh, we need to take a break and, and allow a word from our sponsors right now. We'll be right back. Have you ever considered exporting your product to other countries? Are you interested in importing a product into the country? Well, in Central Florida, the place to go for anything and everything concerning international trade is the Central Florida International Trade Office. They take the mystery out of importing and exporting, and they work with you to tap the global marketplace for your business. Don't miss out on the benefits of global trade just because you don't know how. Connecting with the Central Florida International Trade Office will get you growing. And we're back. We're talking with Khalid Munier, who is the founder and president of Jupiter Properties. Uh, Khalid, I want to uh, ask you a few closing questions uh, to wrap up today. Uh, I want to be uh, a good steward of your time. If you could meet some one person in history and have a conversation, who would that be and what would you talk about? You know, I've always been a student of history, and I studied uh, history very deeply when I was at the university and at school in England. And one of the characters that we study that's always fascinating is a, is a person called Napoleon Bonaparte. He was a French general. He arose from a um, mediocre background to become one of the most powerful people in the world. And um, what you call it. Uh, so I would, uh, I, I would love to meet him. And uh, I talked to him about his military strategy, where by himself, he took on the whole Europe and he succeeded. Sure. And many times uh, it's a uh, business strategy is similar to a military strategy. Uh, not only if, if we're talking about Napoleon, but also Sun Tzu and and to say um, we need to look at business strategy sometimes as how do we uh, dominate the marketplace? Uh, what keeps you up at night? What worries you? I think what really worries me right now is the COVID situation, because the COVID situation is very bad. That you know, you, you it could it, it could affect anybody in your family, anybody in your friends. And I've had uh, I had that situation in my family. I had uh, three of my siblings affected by COVID. I had uh, one of my kids, her uh, spouse, husband and daughter affected by it. So that's uh, probably the thing that is most worrying these days. Hopefully with a vaccine coming out, we can get uh, get over this. But that is really what I think is keeping everybody up these days. And I think uh, that that is a concern for everyone is, is about our health and taking care of our physical health. Uh, with your background, uh, how how do people deal with the mental health aspect of of being quarantined and being home and so much uncertainty? Um, how do you think people are dealing with that? Well, different people, they deal in different ways. Survival comes first before everything else. And uh, there are a lot of mental challenges. There's a lot of, um, uh, for example, I've had a client who wanted uh, another house simply because husband and wife are both professionals. And they said, well, you know what? I can't work at home with my husband. I just need a separate place. <laughs> well, and and sometimes people are, are one is immune compromised and one is not. And and one person is out and and shopping for groceries. But yet when they come home, there, there has to be a separation to protect uh, th the other person that might be immune compromised. So uh, it's it's a very tough time for people to deal with the, the mental aspects of 
of being uh, quarantined or, or being uh, taken away from that social aspect of not only doing business, but just uh, personal. So right now, people are under a lot of stress, uh, not only because of the uncertainty and the economy, but but also because of the mental health aspects of of the changes that we've been through. It's also affecting, uh, for example, the real estate business. I've had um, uh, my clients call me, Khalid, we need a bigger house because we had somebody who had uh, who had uh, Corona, Corona. And therefore, we need a house where which is uh, on two floors. So if somebody has Corona in the family, they can be isolated right, and quarantined in that part of the house. I also think that people are saying, I need extra room because we're all working from home. And, and so I can't share the dining room table with, with my uh, spouse or roommate that's also working. So uh, that has to be a, a, a selling point for real estate in the future. Exactly. And then also uh, the kids are home. So how, home is a school for them. So we need an extra room for the kids. Exactly. Exactly. Let me let me wrap up with a, a few uh, questions that will not require any homework on your heart part. What is your favorite color? Blue. See, I'm wearing blue. <laughs> that, that's right. Uh, what's your favorite movie? Uh, to this day, I still like a movie called Ben-Hur. Uh, Charlton Heston, right? That's probably from our generation. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Are you a coffee drinker or a tea drinker? Uh, having grown up in Britain, tea is my first choice. So I drink tea all the time. <laughs> would, would you consider yourself an introvert or an extrovert? That's an easy one to answer. I mean, I think I'm a very extrovert person. So that's why I'm probably being affected by COVID more than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> sure. What's your favorite uh, dinner? Having born in Pakistan, I still like spicy food, hot and spicy food. So you can give me the most expensive filet mignon. It'll taste tasteless to me unless it has spices and hot, uh, hot spices on it, hot uh, uh, peppers, etc. So I, anything spicy. If I break out in a sweat, it's good. Yeah, there's a Pakistani dish called biryani, which is very traditional. So that's my favorite. <laughs> So you'll order to, that next time you go into a restaurant. You'll have to email that to me so I can. Uh, what is your favorite time of the year? Uh, it's going to be Christmas and New Year or Thanksgiving because that's when all my, all, 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 all my children, they come over and we have a, a good family gathering at home. Sure. What do you do, what do, you do when you're not working? Uh, I... I like to watch the historical channel on TV, which shows the, uh, the traditional Romans and Roman time, about Roman empires, et cetera, because I've always been a student of history and I'm fascinated by history. So I love watching either the old movies, like Ten Commandments, which are very, very, uh, very knowledge, knowledgeable also, as well as entertainment at the same time. And, and I've uh, found the History Channel during this, this shutdown, too. So I've become a fan. Uh, would you rather give a speech or plan the event? Um, I'm comfortable with both, but I'd either prefer to plan events at a macro level rather than at a micro level. In other words, set, set the strategy, et cetera, how it is to be done and let somebody else handle the details of it. Sure. Uh, final question. Uh, if you were going to go out um, to entertain yourself, what would you drink? Well, I don't drink alcohol, so that's out. Tea? <laughs> so that, that limits the choices. So tea? that kind of brings it down to uh, tea or... Uh, um, well, my favorite drinks are actually really um, healthy drinks like kombucha. Kombucha tea? Yes. Or uh, anything with ginger... Anything with uh, turmeric, that kind of stuff. So I'm a, I'm a health craze person. <laughs> uh, I, I threw a, a waiter a curve when I asked for uh, soda water the other day. And, uh, and so I, I've become a fan of soda water over the last few months. Uh, so it's, it's one of those where you say, uh, I have to try different things. So you'll have to email me the different drinks too, because I love ginger and I love ginger ale. So... <laughs> I'll have to find out where to get that. Especially in the COVID situation. They're very healthy for you. Builds up your immune system. <laughs> Khalid, tell me, uh, 
before we sign off here, uh, tell me about the experience of, of being a partner at the National Entrepreneur Center. Well, with our 16 resource uh, partners at the, at the NEC, it's a great source for businesses, especially the new businesses that are starting up, to get all the information that they need and all the avail that are available to the to the to the to the new businesses, etc. Not only that, we've had uh, a lot of international delegations coming into the National Entrepreneur Center over the past five years, and senior people like we've had the amb- Qatar, Qatar's ambassador to the United States coming in. We've had uh, the labor minister from Morocco coming in, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a source for all the businesses, whether you are a small business or you are a, a business with over 100 employees, et cetera, the resources that are available there and, and, and the knowledge and uh, the sources that we built up over the last uh, nearly 20 years they are excellent, and I advise every business person to get connected and find out for themselves uh, what is in there that can help their business also. As I travel the country, I speak to business conventions, and uh, many times when they hear about the the Entrepreneur Center and what we do here, uh, they're amazed. And yet, because we're here and we deal with this every day, sometimes we tend to take that for granted. So I'm always interested in in people's perspective uh, after they've experienced what we do here. Uh, Thank you for your time. I I know you're a busy guy, and I appreciate you taking time out to talk to us and share some of your wisdom with our listeners today. So thank you very much, and uh, I hope to see you in person soon at the National Entrepreneur Center. Thank you so much, Jerry. It was a pleasure talking to you and uh, look forward to connecting you soon. If you have a business question that you would like to have answered, or if you would like to suggest a topic for discussion, we would love to hear from you. Just email jerry at hello at nationalec.org. That is hello at nationalec.org. Welcome back. Some for some final thoughts after that uh, inspiring interview, uh, the international perspective, uh, him, his, his approach on keeping and taking care of your employees. You know, I, I really felt like that's uh, something that, that we all can work on and making that uh, environment for your employees. It has so many diverse backgrounds, diverse opinions that, that really come together to make you stronger as a company. Oh, yes, it does. Um, just making sure that everyone's at the table that really makes people feel that they're important and that what their work is doing, what they're doing with their work um, is really important for the company and all all around is gonna make a better company do what their whole purpose is right. move forward. And, and I think that's one of the strengths of the National Entrepreneur Center that we have here. Uh, we have the Asian American Chamber, the African American Chamber, the Hispanic Chamber. Uh, we have lots of international influence around the table. and. And we have those discussions on what we should do and where we should uh, focus more attention. And and there is a diversity of opinions around that table. But what I find is is that that's our strength because when we finally do agree on how we're gonna compromise and move forward, uh, it's made up from perspectives that that aren't just uh, a single perspective. And so um, it's just a, a, a good reminder that having lots of input and lots of perspectives makes for a, uh, a much better organization, a much better company, and, and a much better relationship. I think when he was talking about getting to know what cultures are around the table um, and embracing those really helps with stereotyping and just making sure everyone um, just has something unique to bring to the table. And so there isn't anything negative or bad. Um, everyone's just there. Right, and they and they bring their experience, uh, and so if you allow for that input, uh, I I think that's the way to to make a much stronger uh, culture in your community, and that will make people stay around. Oh, for uh, sure. You know, it was interesting that that his his folks stay around, and so that means there's a good productive culture, and that people do feel heard, and so. Um, that's that's a, a a great way to start the week. I'm I'm going to uh, make sure that I make it around and and 
and show the value of each employee and their background and experience and, and get their input. Because I think a lot of times we get busy and, and we're focused on, uh, getting things done. Yeah. That tunnel vision. You're just trying to get on, <laughs> get everything off your list, but you got to make sure that everyone around you is also just feeling that warmth. Right. And so let me ask you, do you feel that way here? Oh, I always feel warm. Yeah. <laughs> you, you have to say that, right? <laughs> We're on camera, Jerry. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's true. We have a good family here. We have a good culture and a good we re do. <laughs> working relationship because of people like Khalid. Uh, who help us uh, reach out and include uh, input from lots of different areas. So make that your goal for this week. Uh, stop, listen, and include those uh, perspectives that you may not have had time to include before. Make time this week. Include that perspective that you may not have gotten before, and that will make you a better business owner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.